Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Beit Midrash, uh, and welcome to Parshat Toldot, uh, and Rabbi Sachs's commentary on Parshat Toldot. Um, glad y'all are here, and glad you're joining us. I was trying to look at my calendar and be like, that, that is the right Parsha. I'm reading the right, I am teaching the right thing, correct? So, um, so uh, glad y'all are here, glad to be learning together. Um, We'll start off general reactions, thoughts, comments to Rabbi Sachs's comment um, commentary on Parshat Tolder. I think it was a little forced. Okay, say more. Right. Um, hmm? I said I agree. I yeah, it, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. Okay. Um. Say more. Well, let's see how to put this. Um, to, to make the differences between the 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 um, uh, Esau and um, uh, and uh, it's like just about. Um, no, it's not, I uh, uh, just about um, being a, a, a man of the field versus a man of uh, who is not of the field, and then pushing that to people um, being idealistic. I think. Um, I, I, th I think he kind of wants to make that point without without um, uh, really having the, the data to back it up. Suzanne, what were your thoughts? Yeah, somebody say this better, please. Well, I think I, I well maybe I read another commentary which made more sense to me about not that your position in the family um, and, or your occupation didn't have to limit or didn't have to determine what you were in life or who you were in life. And um, they did a, a whole thing on the closeness of the word Bukhara, which means firstborn, and Barach, which is blessing um it's the same was this the hadar commentary yeah yeah i read that too. Did you read okay. that i thought i thought his was actually much better than rabbi Sachs. Um, maybe next time we'll read uh we'll read uh shoot, his name rabbi uh shoot, father again kasher rabbi david kasher uh he's fantastic um, right. In my mailbox, and I didn't read it. That sounded interesting. Yeah. Yes, Barbara. Maybe I forgot, but it seemed this time he relies more on Midrash than he has in the past. Oh. And Midrash, we can all write Midrash. We can all explain. Give us two pieces of information, and I'll give you a novel. You know, so you have to understand that midrash and he does come back and compare it a little bit to what the torah says but midrash gives you a whole lot of information that the author made up maybe to where you say it was forced maybe that's where it comes from i'm sorry rabbi no i was no that's fine I was happy to let you finish I'll, I'll kind of slightly i read it slightly differently um I think one, first of all, there, there's rules for Midrash. You, 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 can't, you can't just say whatever you want in Midrash. Um, there are rules by which you have to follow. There's like a process and rules. So you can't, there, you know, it does sometimes read like it and feel like they're just saying whatever they want, but there are rules. And if you look in almost any Sidor, um, I know both 
the Sim Shaloms and the Lev Shalem, and almost every Orthodox Fedor has Rabbi Yishmael's 13 principles by which you can derive um, Midrash. So um, I just wanted to give a slight defense of Midrash. Uh, <laughs> it's not just, you know, say whatever you want. Um, and usually Midrash is there to make a point. Um, as my teacher, Rabbi David Blumenthal, used to say, is like, real Midrash always has a value statement that it's trying to push. That it's not just telling a story, it's telling a story in order to push a value that is core to rabbinic or Jewish thought. So, you know, the classic example I always give is, um, you know, Jake, we'll get to it shortly, but that Jacob is supposed to work seven years to marry Rachel and then Levon switches Leah in and it asks the question, like the Midrash asks the question, how did Jacob not know he was sleeping with the wrong sister? And it goes into this lavish thing of Levon had this huge feast and they drank a lot and he made sure that he was well fed and well drank. And then Rachel was laying under the bed making the sounds while Leah was in the bed with Jacob and going back and forth. And Jacob wakes up in the morning and look, there's Leah. And Jacob goes, what did you do? How could you deceive me like this? And Leah looks at him and goes, look who's talking. You have no right to be accusing me of deception when you're the one who tricked your brother twice. Mm -hmm. um, and so like looking at that Midrash, Rabbi Blumenthal says it's teaching this principle, this value of Midah Kenegad Midah that um, karma, so to, like as we usually think of karma, that what you do comes back to you in, in kind. Jacob deceived his brother. He's once he's deceived by he's deceived by Levon and by switching the sisters. He deceived his brother a second time. Levon actually tricks him a second time later on. And so that's, and then he gets, again, he tricks Levon. He gets tricked by his own children. So there's this kind of, it always gets paid back to you. What you do gets paid back. Just to paint a picture that like Midrash is there to teach a value is what at least one view of, one scholarly view of Midrash is it's there to teach a value proposition. In this case, what I kind of felt like is like he does give a he does give the midrash and then says, "Okay, now if you don't like the midrash, here's another alternative. <laughs> here's another way to look at it." Um, I didn't find his midrash argument all that convincing, personally, but um, that's me. Margaret looks like she's processing. So somebody have a something while she's processing to uh, any other thoughts, comments, reactions? Um, what I was thinking about was this trope of the um, the younger of of the younger son um, then then turning out then being the strong one um, and I mean, the two most obvious examples, and maybe there are others that I can't think of, or, 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 or um, this one, and then, and then Joseph. Um, yeah, it, it's, you know, but, Moses was the youngest, David was the youngest, Solomon was the fourth born, Judah was the fourth born. Um, it, it keeps coming back to, yes. Um, Eleazar uh, gets the high priesthood over his, or, over his brother Pinchas. Um, this motif keeps circling back. Yeah, so what's that all about? What do you think that's all about? Are you, are you asking the group or are you asking me? I'm asking oh. whoever has, <laughs> has a, something to say about that because it's done you know, it's done so often, it seems like it's meant that it's yeah. meant to really drive. And you've given many more examples than I even knew about, uh, let alone could think of um, it. But it happens so often, it seems like it's it's meant to teach us that it can. I mean, I think, you know, everything in Torah is there to teach us something. Um, 
Anybody want to chime in? Rachel and Leah is another example. Rachel's the younger one and gets the preference over Leah. Um, so I think they're often, I think that I hear similar to what Suzanne said. Uh, uh, if you if you read Rabbi David Kasher, um, who's the Hadar Institute in New York every year has another staff member who will write all the Divrei Torah every week for the year. And this this year, Rabbi Kasher is doing. Um, and you know he does make the argument of in in ancient society, it's the firstborn who is who has the superior status but that what the torah is trying to teach is that that shouldn't define you know, your birth order should not define your success or your blessing moving forward but that rather there's something deeper within you that should define that that your ability to achieve blessing is not defined by you being the first though the torah also does preserve that inheritance structure, that the firstborn gets a double portion and the rest is divided. The whole thing, uh, the way it works is, you know, it's divided among equally amongst the children, and then the firstborn gets double portion, and then everybody else gets equal portions beyond that. Um, so how, so I think that's kind of the general commentary and the general thrust of what you know, I generally have learned is that you, it's not defined, your, your ability to bring in blessing into this world is not defined by your birth order. However, I think what Rabbi Sachs is trying to argue is great. So what is it about the younger one that's actually, what is it about the younger one that makes them deserving of the blessing over and over again? And I think that's the question Rabbi Sachs is trying to struggle with. And, this, and his argument is, at least as we've seen so far with Ishma, Isaac and Ishmael and then Jacob and Esau, the elder is tied into the land. Their physical beings, their home in, what did he say? Their home in nature, they're strong, adroit. Is that pronounced correctly? I don't know. What? Um, unafraid of the wild. Um, Jacob is not, Jacob and Isaac are not portrayed the same way. They're portrayed as homebodies, as um, more meek, more mellow, more thoughtful. And continuously in the Midrash, you come across these themes that, you know, Esau's going out hunting in the fields. Isaac, uh, Jacob is sitting there studying Torah. Um, Isaac has went to set, sent away to yeshiva. Ishmael is, you know, shooting bows and arrows. Um, so uh, the Midrash kind of keeps reinforcing this idea that it's not about your physical prowess. It's about something deeper, more innate within you that that brings blessing into this world. His argument is what is, so what is Rabbi Sachs's argument about what that is? What he said, you have to believe in something other than yourself or higher than yourself. Yeah, you, you have a connection and believe in something beyond nature. So, so it seems sort of self-serving for the for the rabbis to come up with this interpretation, because rabbis in general, present company excluded, maybe uh, tend to be more introspective, more studious, more blah blah blah, and less out in nature, hunting and fishing and having fun. Well, there's envy there. The rabbis are envying them. So they're trying to show them as being, you know, having qualities that aren't all that great. Um, <laughs> maybe. 
Um, well, I think there's something else too. Uh, being a firstborn myself, I think firstborn children have a natural advantage. They get more attention. Besides, I mean, the society back then definitely they're the ones that inherited the lands many t times. But just from a psychological point of view, they get attention. They're taught more and um i think the ensuing children especially in in big families learn how to get along how to take care of themselves that they're more sensitive i mean they i don't know well, you know a lot of times especially in big families they also learn more responsibility you know uh, the old, how do how do like how do these orthodox families have 10 kids and how do they handle their 10 kids because the older ones take care of the younger ones right. so it's not all on the parents they you know they're expected to take on more responsibility to help raise the raise the children also um well the the word is that's why in here suzanne <laughs> But what you said, there, there are more expectations on the oldest one. As you right. go down the line, you kind of give up more. Right. <laughs> and but the, uh, the other thing is the oldest oldest ones tend to be mm, more conventional and more uh, in following, you know, the parents' uh, in, uh, footprint footprints in some sense and the, the younger ones tend to be the more tend to be the more unconventional ones um which um in in a certain sense contradicts what what the sex is saying is that in that uh, um The um, the elder child, I mean the younger child here, is um, following more of the kind of traditional family values. Maybe that's not. I'm not sure it's traditional family values, but it's more of the faith that is that God once passed down. Mm -hmm. I think that's. So, hey. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Re yeah, Rabbi, uh, this is Stuart. Um, yes. I've been listening. Barbara and I are actually in New York up on Amsterdam and 79th having a, a lunch. Yeah, and listening to your Bait Midrash. Have some corned beef or roast beef for me. There you go. I'm the center of Jewish life right here. <laughs> um, so my question, it doesn't have to do with birth order, but it has to do, here we are in the, um, with the war going on in the Middle East, and so many of our young men are over, you know, fighting uh, to help preserve the state of Israel and Judaism, et cetera. And the um, Haredi are studying Torah. You know, they're not the ones that are fighting. And that, you know, that whole thing, just I know God would love for us to study more Torah, but how do you explain our acceptance of, of people who are doing the fighting versus who are studying the Torah? And what's What's important and how, how should we move on from that? So I'll say two things. Um, I think in their rationale, they are supporting the troops by studying the Torah that the troops are not. Um, and that they are spiritually sustaining them by ensuring that Torah is continuously read uh, or studied. That being said, Actually, what you're seeing in Israel, though it's not getting a ton of press, is the Haredim are actually jumping in to join the army um, in significant numbers in ways that the state of Israel has never seen before, because they realize they can't sit back and study Torah while this is going on, and that they need to be part. Like they're at, they're in danger as much as anybody else, and that they need to be a part of. Um, part of the fight also. And for a couple weeks now, it's been that the Haredim are actually jumping in, jumping up to join. Them. Where do you, where do you, 
hear this from Rabbi because I read some, uh, I read two Jewish newspapers almost every day and I don't, I have not seen. I'm that. not sure it's like the big press item because there's more pressing issues, but I have heard it from a couple sources. <laughs> I think that we're that we're missing something really important in what Rabbi Sachs wrote. On page 27, he says, we will only understand the Torah if we recall that every other religion in the ancient world worshiped nature. That is where they found God and more precisely the gods. So I think he's making the argument like that that the Torah was seek one of the lessons of the Torah was seeking to differentiate the Jewish people from from the up uh, the others, and um, so lifting up um, now like saying the importance of a different type of person rather than in in a way of differentiating if like if the others were you know we're glorifying people that that you know were in nature like you know the hunters you know Esau. Um, then we we need to be different. We need to, you know, the 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 the, the Isaacs and um, and that kind of thing. So I think that you know that's a really important part of his argument. Um, but still, I you know I agree with everybody else that he just made some leap <laughs> to get where he wanted to go. So, but, but um, I did like that. No, I, you're right. I do think that is an important part. I was hoping to come back to it. So thank you for doing so. Um, what's, what's he saying? There's, you know, what's wrong with Ishmael and Esau being strong, unafraid of the wild nature people? What's wrong with that? Well, not that there's anything wrong with it, but if that's, but rather than just glorifying that kind of person, there is a, there is a place in the world, an important place in the world for more, more soulful people as, um, as, as leaders uh, of a people, that it doesn't have to be just the strong warrior, um, that it can be, you know, the soulful thinker who can, who can lead, who can lead a people as well. Right. Also, the fact that that um, uh, both uh, Esau and um, Ishmael are are described as impetuous. Um, they're not. They're not. They're not thoughtful. They just they act kind of instinctually without the without without thinking, and that's. Yeah, I, I wonder how much of that he ties in with the same nature argument, too, is that, you know, because mm -hmm. they are not, because they are reliant on nature, there's something impetuous about them. Um, well, but you could say that, but I mean, their actual behavior is, I yeah. mean, their, their actual behavior is impetuous. I mean, yes, yes. I, um, I'm wondering how much Rabbi Sachs would say that their nature abilities Lee is creates their behavior, right? Like their connection to nature is tied in with their behavior that they're doing. Oh, yeah. I, well, what Rabbi Sachs says is that they believe they worshiped nature instead of worshiping God who created nature. Right. They wor worshiped the sun and the, the moon and things like that. Not, well, yeah, not he talks about Esau, ancient cultures in other, general, other not people. necessarily Esau and Ishmael, but yes. No, no, no. And I guess that's a, a theme throughout the the Torah is sort of against other ways to distinguish from other other religions. But I'm curious, it's too bad. I don't know if Stuart is listening, um, but I was interested in this and in his um, Esau's, I mean, <laughs> Sachs's argument um, that um, uh, scientists in the 20th century scientists um, are people for whom science has taken the place of religion still worship nature in the same way that um, 
Isa and or the ancient um, the other ancient cultures or uh, uh, Isa and uh, uh, Ishmael. I was Are planning we, to come back to that too. What were your guys' thoughts was, and reactions? I was really uncomfortable with that, Margaret, but then I was eased by getting to the last sentence of that paragraph, which he identifies them as the scientific atheists. So, you know, he's qualifying it there and he's, okay, which is first, atheism or science, you know, in, in terms of priority. But I, I share your discomfort, or it was expressed. <laughs> uh, I interpreted it as your discomfort. Um, because it doesn't give a very uh, flattering view. So yeah, I wish Stuart would stop eating lunch and talk. <laughs> I, I am actually know? listening, but there's, there's so much noise here, I didn't want to um, come off the mute function. But I would just say that, um, you know, as time goes along and more science is understood and revealed, uh, it there's less uh, belief that you have to have, and you know, belief in in that. I I see this happening, and I can't explain it. Therefore, it must be some godly sort of uh, explanation for it. But I don't think we'll ever, ever, ever get to a stage where uh, there's not going to be some belief that's needed. I mean, I, I really think there's uh, an, virtually an infinite amount of new information to be discovered and an infinite amount on top of that, that, that is a belief. So I think there, and I've always thought that, um, uh, that God and, and nature or science can coexist. I mean, that's really what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't, uh, you don't need to try to get rid of all belief in order to uh, understand science or to understand um, religion. So that, that's sort of the way I look at it. It, may, it still makes me a little uncomfortable in my own field. Um, God wants us to know that there's something beyond nature. Then I think that you need to be concerned about what about these devastating earthquakes, devastating floods? We can't just say that's nature, that the tectonic plates move at certain rates. No, God has control. So, that me. Um, yeah. as, as my teacher, Rabbi Brad Artson, would say, um, all powerful, all knowing, all good, you can have two out of the three. Mm. You have all three, you've got a philosophical problem. Um, this might be an interesting book to read down the line. Um, and I quoted it, some of it for the last Torah on tap, cheap plug. Um, but, uh, you know, Rabbi Artson takes the view that he, he takes the view that you are kind of teaching, Barbara, which is that God created this world and created the world in such a way that sometimes things just happen because that's the way the world was created. You know, sometimes... Yes, the tectonic plate, God created the world in such a way that te the tectonic plates kind of move and sometimes they crash into each other and they and the earth and there's an earthquake. And sometimes they do it with enough force that it creates a devastating earthquake. That's not evil necessarily. It's a natural consequence of the way the world works. A lot of people haven't heard the uh, Rabbi Artson uh, explanation and will be very concerned about what did they do if you're believing in a powerful controlling God, what did they yeah. do so that 700 people, 700,000 people die? Yeah. It's, is it a tragedy? Yes. Is it horrible? Yes. Is it sad? Yes. Should we be grieving and mourning? Yes. Is it evil? Not necessarily. It's just a consequence of living in this in the world that God created. You make the same argument with you know, he makes the same argument with cancer. God can't stop the world from acting the way the world works, but God can 
but God did create a world in which genes naturally mutate and sometimes they mutate in ways that are damaging to the person so you are you're arguing the point of view that 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 god kind of created stuff and then sort of stepped back and withdrew which is i mean and and i don't know um yitz greenberg seems to have a a similar kind of kind of viewpoint except that he he said it, it, it that it's it's kind of and it was happened in a more gradual fashion that uh, that God created things and then and then kind of slowly and slowly and slowly over eons or however long or five thousand years or one thousand years or whatever just stepped back and uh, just started watching I guess. Um, so I think where I think where Rabbi Artson differs mm -hmm. is that he would argue, I believe, he can correct me, he can watch this video and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he would argue, I believe, that God did not step back, but that God keeps at, God is with us to keep asking asking us to choose to make the next right choice. But that as human beings with free will, we have to make that choice constantly to keep making the right choice. But that God can't force us to do anything. God can only pull at us, lure us. And he uses the word lure. Like he can lure us towards the right choice, but we have to actually get there. Um, so, okay. so what are we praying to God for? What are we praying to God for? Yeah, um, I mean, God, God's not going to intervene. God's not. Right. Well, I mean, so what? So what are we um, praying to God for? We are praying to God to one solidify our relationship with God. It's a form of communication that we go back and forth um, with God to a hear what God asks of us and understand what God wants from us better and to voice our what our needs back to God, which help, also helps us figure out what we need to do to get those needs. So, you know, similarly, uh, my, my rabbi growing up, Rabbi Victor Merriman, probably the one thing I remember from my Hebrew high class, <laughs> used to say, like, you can't ask God to give you an A on the test. God won't do that. You can ask God for wisdom. You can ask God for patience to study. You can ask God um, for the tools that you need in order to get an A on the test. I that you can that. pray for. I have said that so many times. But you cannot pray for an A because God's not going to miraculously give you an A. It's why I get a little wishy-washy on you know people who celebrate touchdowns and thank god for the touchdown and it's like you know on one hand that's their profession and that's their job at least in the nfl in college they're trying to get a job in the nfl um and it, every touchdown helps them do that and so but you know on one hand like it feels like does god really care no but did god give them the strength and the wisdom and the discernment and being able to read the play correctly and being able to be faster and stronger than the other players in order to get the time. God gave them that ability and they, sure, thank God for giving you that ability to do that. But God didn't score the touchdown. You did it. You just had to use your innate abilities. Um, so prayer helps us understand what we need and gives us the pull to be able to understand what God wants from us to go do it. Would it be correct to say it's also a form of comfort when we talk about a bad situation and then mm -hmm. you see the advertisements that if, well, I don't really mean advertisements, the notices 
every woman please light candles this week, you know, that kind of thing. The the goal of that, it seems to me, is clearly you're doing something. You're getting comfort from some act that, you know, really, I guess, is a way of bringing God into, into your daily acts. Yeah, uh, and, and I think... I think prayer can bring prayer and ritual can bring comfort when you are grieving or mourning or in distress because it helps guide you. A, it helps guide you on what you need to do next, but also it reminds you that you're not alone. And that's one of the most difficult things when you're in distress or when you're grieving or when you're mourning is this feeling of like you're by yourself and no one else understands it. Um, there's a great Midrash in the Mishnah, or it's not even a Midrash, there's a great Mishnah in um, Masechet Midot, which largely talks about the dimensions of the temple. But there's this great little Mishnah in there in which they talk about when the Israelites would come to the courtyard, everybody would walk to the right, except the mourners would walk to the left. Those who were in mourning would walk opposite of everybody else. And some of it is that symbolic of I'm not like everybody else at this moment and you can't understand and I can't walk with you in the same way because I'm in a different place in my life. And part of the reason you do that is to call attention to the mourners so that they can say why, what is going on and then you, the community can then support. Um, it's why when people sit shiva, the community goes to their house. They bring them food. They bring cedarim. They pray at the house so that they know that they're not alone and the community is there for them. That's why they sit on low stools because that's how they it kind of reflects their spiritual state. Um, there's also all the things are to kind of highlight the emotional state and let them know that they're not alone. And that people are there for them. Um, but yes, lighting an extra candle as a way of recognizing God is, if that's what you need to do to help you understand that God is here in this world and God wants what's best for us, light the candle. Like, <laughs> that, that doesn't hurt. But coming back to Rabbi Sachs, um, yes, there is a, oh, yes, Barbara. Um, no, I'm back to Rabbi Sachs on page 28. <laughs> well, I was coming back to this discussion on like science is, you know, I, I have had a lot of people who are like, why do I, I don't need, like, I'm not coming to services. I, I like, I don't need, I don't need services or keeping kosher or ritual to feel close to God. I just need to sit in my house and watch the sunset. That's where I find God. And, you know, I, I'm not usually successful, but I think that's a little bit of what Rabbi Sachs is arguing at also, is that the sunset's beautiful. You should appreciate it. And recognize that there's something beyond it also. And that, you know, Judaism is about finding God beyond nature, generally, not just in nature. Um, Liz, what were you going to bring up, Barbara? Well, on page 20, the last paragraph, he's talking about um, not taking children for granted. He does not taking land for granted. And he talks about people thinking about that today, and I guess this applies to, you know, not the 20 year olds yet, but the, will I have Jewish grandchildren? Well, I don't have any grandchildren at the moment. 
it's a very different question than will I even have grandchildren? So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to separate, um, say, Sarah's question was Sarah with an H, not my Sarah. Sarah with an H talking about will I have Jewish grandchildren? No. I don't, I think the issue of grandchildren versus the issue of Jewish grandchildren is two different questions. Yeah, I'm just picking on Rabbi Sachs for that. You like or did not like? I don't think the big question. Or appreciate that he brought up the question. I was trying to get your personal view on the point. Oh, do I want my grandchildren to be Jewish? No, like what was your feeling reading that paragraph at the bottom of 28? My feeling right away was that Jewish grandchildren was not the point. That Jewish grandchildren what? <clears throat> for, for Sarah, Jewish grandchildren was not the point. She would like Ooh. to have a child and then go on to what that child ends up, you know. Um, or even Abraham. Thing like that. I was just using Sarah as, as the classic example. But, you know, um, it's, it's a, I understand why he's using it. But I bet there are just as many Jewish people today who would take, who would be thrilled to have grandchildren if the families are going through infertility issues, et cetera, thrilled to have grandchildren. And if I could only have one, would I pick grandchild, a, a grandchild or only can have a grandchild if I'll take a Jewish grandchild? Um, you can study, you can learn, you can develop a Jewish grandchild. Give me a grandchild. Don't tell my kids that. No, I'm not ready for them to have grandchildren. But. So here's, here's I think on a, on an individual basis, I hear you. I think he's looking at this on a larger scale. Oh, I agree with that. So, you know, not to take infertility as for anybody as a light subject, but at, at least as individuals. But, you know, if Baptists, if a Baptist family doesn't have a child, there's not great concern in the Baptist community that you know, baptism is going, the Baptist movement is going to die out. There's enough Baptists that somebody's bound to have a couple more kids. Not picking on Baptists specifically, but right? Like there's enough Baptists that that's not the, on a larger scale, that one family is not the big, we're concerned for that one family, but it's not going to affect the entire Baptist people. Um, Islam, you could make a similar argument. There's enough Muslims that if one family, yes, you know, Islam promotes having children and I respect that. And yes, for that family, it's devastating. And it's not that all of Islam is going to suffer if that one family doesn't have children or grandchildren. The Jewish people are kind of tied into this because of our minority status, because we are what 0.02% of the world population one family doesn't have kids that's a that's a serious mark on the jewish people like that's that hurts and i'm I, and again i'm not judging individual families by any means and i understand fertility infertility issues and i and i understand self choice and i'm not putting that as individuals, I'm just making a generalized statement from where Rabbi Sachs is trying to come from, is on a worldview, we need more Jewish children, um, is I think what he's trying to argue. And we can't take it for granted that that's a possibility, knowing the infertility issues. So we have to be, we have to celebrate in some way 
every Jewish child because that's an important step in the propagation. Dr. Karen McGinnity, who God willing will be coming in March, um, will talk that there's some sexism, there is some uh, sexism and um, what's the word? Chauvinism implied in that dilemma. Because who's who's who gets put the pressure on to have Jewish children? Not the Jewish men, because they can't produce Jewish children. <laughs> Not on their own, at least. Um, so, you know, there are issues with this dynamic generally. Um, and he doesn't take infertility into account. Rabbi Sachs doesn't take any of the chauvinism into account or sexism. But um, I think the point he's trying to make is land and children generally are taken for granted by everybody except Jews. Jews have never been able to take that for granted. Why? Because we've, until 1948, never had our own land. And since 1948, we constantly are having to defend the, its right to exist, including today. Um, and children, because we've always been such a minority that we can't take that for granted either. I'm just really unhappy about it. I think there are a lot of really reasonable, acceptable, totally um, fine reasons to choose not to have a child. To, it, you know, it's not, as as you say, when you're doing dealing with it on an individual basis, fine. But I don't have 10 kids. Somebody else does have 10 kids. They're doing their part. But I think there's so many good reasons that, as you say, an individual case can't be called to task for this. Right. But and I, I think that's part of the challenge is, you know, as, as the former chief rabbi of the British Empire, Rabbi Sachs wasn't necessarily, he's focused on a global broad issue, right? That's as a chief rabbi, that's kind of what he needed to be doing. Um, I hear you. Like on an individual basis, there's lots of reasons why you might choose not to, and other reasons why you might not be able to. Um, have you, did you guys grow up on this idea of a mitzvah child? Yeah. We, we, we've had that discussion here at Temple Beth Bell. Yeah. I, I remember a couple of conversations to have. Um, yeah. Can you give us what, what is that? So let's say a Jewish couple gets married. And, you know, when you're getting married, you have these conversations of like, do you want to have kids? Yes. So, yeah, oh, I want to have kids too. How many kids do you want? Oh, I want three kids. Great. You want three kids? Have four. Have an extra one have a mitzvah child on top of what you were planning mm -hmm. to help repopulate the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. I grew up with this uh, concept. Uh, I have a little mixed feelings about it, especially in 2023. But it, yeah, this was something that was being plot for a few decades at one point. It was like, you should always have one more child than you were planning to have. <laughs> you, you should do that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's really I mean, easy to tell other people to do that, well, isn't it? Well, <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's so why my, good, my daughter suddenly out of nowhere had an extra child. We're that's all tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, you know, there there have been a lot of times in the book that, that um, I have felt uncomfortable, like Barbara, did, um, in, you know, what Barbara was just talking about with the having the Jewish children thing. And... Um, and maybe just because, you know, Rabbi Sachs is a very smart man, but maybe he's not my rabbi, is what I'm coming to think. Um, I actually look back to see when the book was printed, thinking, well, maybe this is an old book. Not an old book. It, it, um, it's from 2020. And yet I feel like a lot of his attitudes are very, um, he, he uses, and maybe it's because of the brevity of the chapters, but he, he, stereotypes and everything is very black and white and I find him to be very judgmental and um 
maybe he's just not my rabbi. So I'll say a couple things on that. One, I, I already said is that, you know, part of his job as chief rabbi of the British Empire is to take kind of a globalized position. And as a well-respected, with that position comes kind of a larger position within the larger Jewish world of respect and kavod and honor. Um, his job, he viewed his job, I think, in some way as to look out for the long-term health of the Jewish people. And he does so largely by education, but he's also an Orthodox rabbi. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And, you know, I think, I think an Orthodox Jew would read that paragraph and be like, absolutely. Totally get it. Totally agree. Right. And I think for us in a non-Orthodox setting, we understand that there's a, particularly us as conservative Jews, in which we try to balance this modernity and the tradition. And we, we understand, yes, the death rate in the Jewish population has exceeded the birth rate for 20 or 30 years. Um, my understanding is it still is. It may have balanced out, but it's, you know, for a long time, the death rate was higher than the birth rate in the Jewish population. Um, and so I think we understand that, but we also look at the reality of life and understand, well, like, how are we actually supposed to do that? Well, I mean, I, under, I understand that, but I, I just, um, I'm uncomfortable. Go Barbara. Sometimes that's how we learn <laughs> is by being uncomfortable. Do you think? But sometimes, since sometimes became... you know, sometimes we, A, we learn by being uncomfortable. And B, um, you know, I, I wrote, I think I wrote this when I was applying to rabbinical schools. I They said, like, who's a rabbi you, like you've learned from? And I said, well, like, here's a couple of rabbis I've learned from. And here's a couple of rabbis I've learned from on the negative side. Right. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. it's important to say, you know what? I don't like that. <laughs> and sometimes you have to expose yourself to it to learn what's not you. Well, I'm, I'm going to continue reading. So. Of course. But... So, so to Barbara and to Cindy, I, I have to say that I've long admired Rabbi Sachs's writings, and this is the first book where I've had so many questions about what he wrote. But uh, Barbara, more to your point, when you were talking, I, I think there's more than one way to influence uh, Jewish children. And when you look at our Jewish day school, um, it's named after a man who did not have children, but who was extremely influential in the future of Jewish children coming up in Birmingham. Am I wrong? Yeah. What did he do? Excuse me. <laughs> Dr. 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 Miles, did he not donate the money after didn't which the, the day he gave money. money to have his name on the day school? And I think, Howard, you would let, have to let agree. Me, let me maybe put this. I, I get what Diane is saying. And so let me put this in a different context. Yeah, there's more than one way to do it is all um, I'm saying. You know, um, my my Rebbe, Reb Mimi Feigelson, um, has, has never gotten married, never had children of her own. But she considers each of her students her children. Right. Her spiritual children. And by teaching and educating and passing on, she has hundreds if not thousands of spiritual children that she has influenced in her career and so yes to barbara's point you um you know there's a section of talmud in which it, there's five questions you're asked when you die um in masechet shabbat and uh, rava says one of the questions is did you have children and dr ron wolfson in his commentary on this says very quickly says it's not just birth children, but anybody you've mentored, anybody you have passed on values to, anybody that you have influenced is in some way your spiritual child. So yes, there are ways you can influence without right. giving birth. We had Rabbi Culpepper here. Could we say that she didn't have any children? 
Could, could I was never actually that? super clear whether she had children. So yeah. she's a <laughs> yeah. wonderful. She's a wonderful example. I, right. She's right. another wonderful example, right? Like she, people still talk about her. What twenty years later, almost thirty years later. Twenty um, years after she. Yeah, passed. and there are people that have Jewish children who create Jewish children too. I just want to say thank you, yeah. Mo Rob Bierman. <laughs> yes, Margaret. Uh, yeah, I read, maybe it's too late to bring up something else, but I read this in a different way. Was not only, uh, not only having physical children or teaching children, but also in this age of mixed marriages and assimilation and so on and so forth, having children who actually follow the path of Judaism. Yeah, I do think that's a little bit where he was coming from in his comments about grandchildren. And that's not a, that's not, you can't take that for granted anymore. Um, I, I do think that's implied in his comment, like in that sentence. Um, he shouldn't have and, taken the shortcut. He should have said, will we have children who follow Jewish ideals like that? He didn't say, I mean, he doesn't have to say ritual. He yeah, doesn't yeah. They have to go to services. So again, for an Orthodox said, rabbi, I think it's a different conversation that he's trying to have. But I do think that's implied is like, are you going to have children? Yeah. Are you going to have Jewish grandchildren? And, you know, some of us might be more or less okay with that idea. Um, but for an Orthodox rabbi and the chief rabbi of the British Empire, that's a devastating idea that you don't. Um, an Orthodox so rabbi doesn't just think to that understand you're where he's coming from. I'm sorry to talk over you, <laughs> but an or an an Orthodox and ultra Orthodox rabbi doesn't think that we poor conservative Jews fit that definition. So I mean, he. From what I understand, he had a little bit of a mixed relationship with conservative with non-Orthodox Judaism. Um, I think in his right, from what I've kind of heard through the grapevine, he in his writings and publicly was very, I don't care what branch of Judaism you are, as long as you're Jewish. And he very much took that approach of you're Jewish, you're Jewish. If you're a Jew, you're a Jew, and we need more Jews. Um, what I've heard is privately, he was a little more ambiguous and uh, what's the word? Um, ambivalent, I think is probably, he was a little more ambivalent about non-Orthodox Judaism. But I mean, take that with a grain of salt because that's kind of through the grapevine. So um, it may have been a couple, one or two people, a couple people may have had a bad experience and interpreted it in a way that he was <laughs> less less in favor than he actually was. Um, but um, to try to circle back to the main point, I think you know his concept here of. Um, you need to believe beyond yourself you can't if you limit yourself to yourself to nature you, you're you're bounding yourself within the physical but well, what's the old saying you know you reach for the moon even if you miss you'll land upon amongst the stars right you guys heard that phrase it's plastered over my school growing up um <laughs> i heard it like all the time like reach high and have high values, high ideals, because that's what you'll strive to reach for. If you believe beyond the world, you believe beyond nature, you believe in a God that is beyond nature, and you believe in values that transcend nature, then that's what you'll strive to achieve, and you, that's what you, and you can make the world better that way. And that's what he argues Isaac and Jacob represent. You don't have to agree with how he got there. That's just that's his argument of what they represent. And so, you know, 
I like the bit. I like the lesson. We can disagree on whether we liked how he got there, but the lesson itself is it still has some value to it. That reach to be the, you know, something great and reach beyond, have have the highest values you can because that's what you're ultimately going to try to achieve. Any closing thoughts, comments? I just wanted to make sure we got to his big, his life-changing idea since, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time how he got there, but we didn't actually talk about the idea itself. So, um, Any final comments, thoughts, reactions? Thank you. Thank you all for learning. Um, Kola Kavod. Um, as a reminder, we will not meet next week. Um, so happy Thanksgiving. If you're traveling, enjoy your travels, have safe travels. And um, if you're having people come to you, enjoy having the family and friends with you. If you are not, then enjoy whatever it is you're doing. Uh, enjoy whatever it is. Find time to be grateful and thankful. Um, and we'll do, we'll cover uh, Vayetze and Vayishlach um, on the 30th in two weeks. Thank so, you, Rabbi. Happy Passover. Thank you all for coming. Happy have Passover. Yeah, happy. <laughs> and as always, if you want to discuss it more, let me know. Um, we can find time to discuss off, off soon. So. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Be well.